Lord, we gather in this Advent season thankful that you are a God who delights in blessing your children. You have seen us through a year that was filled with challenges and troubles, and you have given your church a brand new year in which we can worship, serve, fellowship, and love. You have enabled our congregations to transform our weaknesses into bonds of cooperation and unity. Truly, the churches of this community are greater together than the sum of the parts. You have shown us how to be doers of the word and not merely hearers. By ministering to the weak, the discouraged, and the needy, we have seen the face of Jesus in unexpected and marvelous ways. You have given us strong and capable church leaders to guide and to teach us. You have enriched our lives in so many ways that we could not begin to mention them. So Lord, as these Advent services take place through the gift of technology, we pray that you would multiply their reach and effectiveness and that each person on this earth who sees these messages would be drawn into a closer relationship with our Lord Jesus and with each other. We pray that you will strengthen and grow our congregations and their scope, their ministries, their health, and their faithfulness. Help us to be churches that truly are making disciples for the transformation of this world. Bless your precious children in the days to come as we celebrate again and anew the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. We ask all these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Our scripture on this Advent devotional, our first week of Advent, is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 beginning with verse 25. We are actually eight days after Christmas, but there's a beautiful story that I would like to share with us that helps us learn to wait with hopeful anticipation for not only to celebrate Christmas, but also for Christ's return. So I invite you to hear God's word. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When we think about how that Christmas story unfolded, it's amazing how few people noticed what had happened in the world. This significant uh, moment when God became flesh, when he entered into this world, when the light shined in the darkness and the, the word became flesh among us. And, and when Jesus was born, when he took that first breath of this earthly air and no one seemed to notice this great change that was taking place aside from a few shepherds on a hillside in Bethlehem that, that, that only knew because a heavenly host of angels revealed it to them and then they would go and see this child that was born and then you can imagine their excitement 
leaving Mary and Joseph and the child and telling everyone that would listen to them all that they had experienced and heard from the angels. And as they saw the child for themselves, probably very few people would listen because the, the story of shepherds well, was usually not believed. They were looked at just a little higher than tax collectors. And I can't help but think that maybe uh, an innkeeper that would stop in and check on Mary and Joseph and the child and give them uh, uh, comfort and assistance and compassion, feeling guilty that there was no place for them in his inn. Uh, but other than that, a few people, maybe curiosity seekers would stop by. Wise men would come a couple of years later. God had changed the world and it seems as though everyone had missed it. Uh, because of their expectations were something far different. The people lived in a world and in times that were not so different than our own. So many people lived in fear. And so many people just felt as though there was no real hope for the future. And so for centuries they had prayed and hoped and expected and anticipated God would send his Messiah. And, and over those years they had become prisoners to their own expectations. They thought that the Messiah would come in a certain way, in a certain place, at a certain time. And it would be along the lines of King David of old when Israel was the superpower in the world and, and David would form a, a strong army and defeat their enemies. And, and, and this Messiah would be just like him and set up a strong government, a strong military. The economy would be booming and everyone would be happy and wealthy and, and prosperous and peaceful. But that was their expectations. But God knew that we needed something more than an earthly kingdom, an earthly savior. He knew that we needed someone to save us from our true enemies of sin and death and darkness. And, and only he could do that. So he came in, in, in himself to, to be that savior for us. But he wasn't the savior that the people wanted or expected. No one expected the savior to be born of, of this poor unknown couple named Mary and Joseph in a place in Bethlehem that wasn't even a, a real dwelling place for humans. But that's the way that God works. God isn't going to be boxed in by our expectations. And so Mary and Joseph uh, have this great responsibility of carrying God's son into this world. They didn't know anything about raising a family. They were just trying to establish their own life and, and do the best that they can. So eight days after this child is born, they do what they knew that they needed to do and take the, ch the child to the temple where he would be circumcised, given to God and given his name. And, and this act of circumcision was, was something very sacred and holy in their traditions and customs because it took them back to the original covenant that God made to Abraham. And now Jesus was a part of that and officially given his name, which means that he would be the one who would take away the sins of the world. That's what Gabriel said his name meant. And from that moment on, he would begin to fulfill his destiny and live up to his name. But in the temple that day, Mary and Joseph would meet two very important and very special people. A man named Simeon and a woman named Anna, both well up in years and both had lived their life with this hopeful expectation of a promise that God had given them that they would not leave this world. They would not see death until they saw the God, the God's Messiah, the savior of Israel. And, and so uh, Simeon was described as a man that was just and devout and led by the Holy Spirit. Just in the fact that he was conforming his life into the character of God. And that's what Jesus does for us. He transforms us from the inside. And as Methodists, we believe, we believe that this is called sanctifying grace, where we become more like Jesus to the extent that we allow him to work and transform us. That means every moment of our lives, every day, every step, every breath, every beat of our heart takes us closer and closer to Jesus himself. And it's a process of, of him working inside of us. And Simeon had lived his life trying to, to get to that point where he was conformed to the character of God, but he's also devout, meaning that he kept a firm grip on the reality of this promise. 
when others would probably try to talk him out of it and, and try to take away his hope and this expectation that this promise would be fulfilled in his lifetime, Simeon held tight to that promise of God faithfully. And this day in the temple, all of that waiting, all of the sacrifice, everything led up to this greatest moment of his life when he would see Jesus. Not only one of the first to see Jesus, but the first to really recognize who Jesus was and what he was here to do. That was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And he takes this child into his hands. And, and you can just imagine Mary and Joseph being brand new parents. And you know how first-time parents are so protective of their infant that's so fragile and delicate and breakable. I, I remember when we first brought my oldest son, Caleb, to church, and we had him in one of those Fort Knox carriers that no one could penetrate or see in because you don't want anybody looking at your child because it might break them. And you know, you're so cautious and careful in the church that I was serving at the time had a man just like Simeon. And somehow he gets through that Fort Knox carrier and he takes our newborn son and disappears in a crowd of people that we didn't even know. And it felt like an eternity. And across the room, we see him lifting him up and showing him off and just treating him like a football. And it was a panic time for us. I imagine Mary and Joseph must have felt the same way, that, that confusion. Who is this man? And how did Simeon know that it was Mary and Joseph and this child that was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made? But Simeon isn't just holding a child in his arms. He's holding hope itself. Hope for every generation. Hope for all the nations. He's not just holding a baby. He's holding the Ancient of Days. He's holding the, the, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's holding eternity in his arms. And as he's holding this child so carefully, he blesses the child. And then he says words that Mary probably wishes she'd never heard. That this child will be responsible for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. And I can't help but think that those words haunted her from that day on until she would see that prophecy fulfilled as Jesus would die on a cross for the sins of the world. But Simeon wasn't the only one in the temple that day that they would meet. A prophetess named Anna, the tribe of Asher, very advanced in age, a widow for a very long time, and she lived in the temple and she worshiped there and she prayed and she fasted and she waited with hope and anticipation that she would see the consolation of Israel. You see what's amazing about Simeon and Anna is that they both were faithful to this promise no matter how long it took they knew that they can trust God and it wasn't just a promise that God would come and save their own people but God would come and save the world. We know that our world today is very divided on so many things. We are divided on everything. We're even divided on how divided we are. And we wonder what can unite us. But in those days, they were divided in two ways, Jews and Gentiles. And both of these dared to see outside of the expectations of the world that when God's Messiah would come, it wouldn't be just for a certain group of people, but it would be for all people. And friends, that hasn't changed. The one thing that unites us is the blood of Jesus. It's the one thing that saves us. It's the one thing that heals us. It's the one thing that brings us together. And it's the only thing that matters. It's, it's the blood of Jesus. And they believed in that promise that the presence of God's Messiah would be for all people. And it would bring us together. You see, God doesn't meet our expectations because God doesn't play by our rules. And they dared to see beyond what was just immediately there in front of them. And they waited with hope. We're people that don't like to wait. We can admit that. You go to a restaurant these days and they tell you it's going to be a 15 minute wait. And you wait in 20 minutes, you're going somewhere else. And then you spend another 20 minutes waiting there. Then an hour and 45 minutes later, you finally sit down at a table somewhere. Last week, 
I had to take my son to urgent care because you can't just get a cold these days and not worry about everything that it might be. And, and so I prepared him when we went to urgent care that it's going to be a while. And, and, and I, I could have sworn that he was going to get better by the time they called us back there. We waited so long. What are we waiting for? Simeon and Anna were waiting for something worth waiting for, for God's promise to be fulfilled for the salvation of Israel, the consolation of Jerusalem. What are we waiting for this season of Advent? We are a people that need hope and hope is around us. Hope has come. We wait for God to do something. You see, when we read this story, we kind of get the idea that Simeon was just waiting for this to happen so that he can die, but I don't believe that for a second. I believe Simeon, just like Anna, was waiting for God to do something. We are waiting for the same thing. Jesus has already been born. We are waiting for his return to come again and set everything right. A, a new heaven and a new earth, a, a, a new life. And, and that's how we find this, this promise fulfilled in us that we wait for the same thing in a different time with the same expectation that God might come in a way that we never see coming. He might come in an out of the way place. It, it's not going to be what we expect, but we wait, not passively waiting, but actively waiting. And Anna gives us the blueprint. We come to church, we worship. She had made the church her heart's home. And for many of us, we've been out of church for a long time, for some for too long. And it's time to get back. It's time to come back and worship together. And, and through it all, we prepare ourselves through praying and through fasting. You see, the question is asked this time every year in some way or another, if Jesus were to be born into this generation, would we recognize him? So few people did on that first Christmas. And I dare say we wouldn't be any better or any wiser. We wouldn't be any more accepting than they were because we have our own expectations. But I believe the people that would recognize him and accept him are the people just like Simeon and just like Anna, whose hearts were prepared and seeking and waiting for this hope to be fulfilled. So we look forward in faith. That's what hope does. It looks forward. Paul says, we press on. We look forward towards the high calling of God through Christ Jesus. And so in this season of waiting, waiting for God to do something once again, know that he's already at work, waiting on us to be a part of what he's doing. And may we find our hope in the promise fulfilled that he walks with us everywhere that we go. So I encourage you this morning, for those in a season of waiting, you're waiting not without hope, but your hope is that Jesus walks with you every step of the way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious, merciful, loving God of hope, we thank you for our time together this day. We thank you that you are ever with us, even when we repeatedly fail you, that you love us and pursue us to restore us to you and to the hope of eternal life with you. In this season of Advent, we thank you for the promise of Advent, the promise of a new life in Christ, because it means that we have the hope of heaven, access to heaven, made possible by Jesus Christ. Although we are constantly reminded by the events and tragedies of this world, of what this world would feel like if there was no hope of heaven, that there would be no hope beyond the grave, only this life and this body ending in the grave. But because Jesus came to us, all that has changed. Because of him, we live in joyful anticipation and the hope of what is yet to come. The Christmas season reminds us that Christ has given us the gift of life with you, Lord God, in heaven. And although this gift is still wrapped and waiting to be opened, the package is ours and has our name on it. Because Jesus came, we know what you, Lord God, are like. We experience forgiveness for our sins and the transformation of our hearts and minds. We have received the promise of heaven and eternal life. Wonderful gifts through your merciful grace, wonderful hope. Your message to us, Lord God, is no situation should be without hope. So we rest in you, God, because our hope comes from you. You are our rock and our salvation, our stronghold. We will not be shaken, especially in times like these when the world is in chaos and rages all around us, so out of control at times. Help us to hold fast to you, merciful and loving God, and cling to that secure hope that is in you and from you, this day and all others still to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.